Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here. We have a new married couple in the room right there. There they are. Yes. Well, it's good to have you guys. We sure love you. Spud, you're a lucky man. You really are. Um, well, sincerely, welcome and good morning. Uh, good morning to all of you, those of you that are in the meeting place and those of you that are watching online. It's great to have you here with us, whether digitally or in person. It's good to share this moment together. Uh, my name is Jim Harper, one of the pastors on staff. And just a few things before we kind of go into our services. Uh, one is, and I was talking to a few of you, uh, just because, well, it's hard to know who's new and who's not new with the masks. That even makes it a little bit more challenging. But uh, if you're here for the first time or you're fairly new to Southside, you would be doing me a great service by coming to the, uh, in the foyer after the service at the information desk and just giving me some more of your information. We, we really do want to be a church that's not only trying to grow large, but we also want to grow small, that we want people to feel a real sense of connection. And getting your information is a great way to start that. Um, if you're watching online, you can just, on the... Uh, the home, our home page, you can go, there's a little box that says response card, you can click on that and give us the same information that way too. So one of the things I was thinking about as we get ready to start today is why are we here today? And uh, one of the things that I say, I would say is possible that we're here today, and, and it would be different than if I was to ask this question six months ago. Many of you would say, and let's think of this in a positive way, I'm here out of habit. This is my habit. This is what I do. I come to church on the Lord's Day once a week and worship with God's people and experience the presence of God. And yet, for the last six months, many of us have gotten out of that habit. And, uh, and yet, you're here today. And so one of the reasons I, I would like to believe that we're all here today is to re-engage Christ with a habit, that habit of coming together once a week on the Lord's Day and drawing near to Him. Jesus makes this a, a, a lot of amazing statements. David's going to be talking about one today about just who he is and the way, the truth, the life. But the other thing that Christ tells us is when believers come together, he gathers with us. In fact, that's the reason we're all here this morning, is that we're here to gather close to Christ. And he's here because he wants to gather close to you. Believe that that there is something going on in this room more than what we can physically see, that the presence of Christ is here because we are here. And we are here because his presence is here. So let's pray for that. And let's kind of prepare our heart for worship and for the Lord. Father, I thank you for the privilege of being a child of yours. I thank you for the faith that you've given me in you. I thank you for this opportunity to be with people I love. But most importantly, Father, I thank you for your presence with us today. Help us, God, to be a people that out of habit we draw close to you. It's not so much about a time and place as it is about a person that we desire to encounter. And your word is very clear, God, that you encounter your people when we come together ways that are very unique and special. So God, I ask that we would draw near to you, that there, if there's any barrier or hindrance or something that's keeping us from experiencing your presence through worship and your word, God, take those things away. May one of those things never be because we don't think you love us or because we don't think you desire to be with us. You have proven over and over again in extreme ways that you are a God that longs to draw near his people. And we are that, and you are he. Just give us that ability. Thank you for this opportunity. In your son's name I pray, and everyone said, amen.
turn my back on the risen sun? Why do I try to earn my place when you made a way for me through amazing grace? Cause I song because it's just packed with the truths of the gospel from start to finish and we get to cry out to God to have his way in our life. So I pray that you will continue to cry out to the beautiful name of God in this next song. You were the word at the beginning, one way
Amen. What a powerful name the name of Jesus is. I'd like to dismiss our little uh, three and four-year-olds to go join our children's ministry. And our volunteers will meet you at the back. They can learn about Jesus in their own language. You guys know three and four-year-olds have their own language. And so they're going to go down there and get loved on. And I tell you, we're going to be opening up more of children's ministry over the next several weeks. But would you all pray with me as we get into God's word together? And thank you for coming to church, man. What an awesome decision you made today. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the worship that we've just had, the opportunity to lift up the good and the holy name of God through the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the truth you have for us today. Thank you for the people you have assembled in this place today, here in the sanctuary, next door, in the meeting place, and of course online. If anyone's watching with us, Lord, we just are so thankful for the ability to to come together in Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, have a seat. Have a seat. Thank you so much for being at church today. Isn't it good to be alive and to be at church together today? So good to be here. Wow, that was uninspiring, but I love you anyways. Maybe your masks keep you from clapping appropriately. I don't know, I'm not a scientist. Um, I wanna talk to you about some great things that Jesus has said from the Gospel of John again today. John chapter 14, verse six. This is one of those red letter Jesus moments you wanna commit to memory when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I wanna keep it real simple today that Jesus is one stop shopping for your soul. Jesus is one stop shopping for your soul. He's got everything you need. Everything you need for peace, whether you're a sinner or a searcher or other, Jesus has it for you. As a man, I enjoy one-stop shopping. I like the kind of places that you can go in and you can get, you know, some motor oil and also a Reese's peanut butter cup. Like places that have it all in one place. Do you guys know the general store in Spokane? This place is an American treasure. It's a throwback. I love this place. You can get bakeware or flame retardant pants in the same aisle. You can buy some fluorescent spray paint for a project or you can get a state parks pass. You can buy some gum or deodorant or maybe you need several water skis. need some bear spray or a people magazine. It's all in the same aisle within your reach. To be more modern, this is why we love Amazon, don't we? From the comfort of our home, maybe in our pajamas, we can get online and and, and you can just find anything that you need. You don't have to wander around town, waste gas money. You just get everything you need right there. I come from a large family. I barely talk about it, but... um, the, uh, the thing that we, when we ate out, I think we ate out, you know, that cost money like three times in my entire childhood. And we would always go to a buffet, you know, so like one person could get fried chicken, someone else, you know, could get salad. And then that one kid could just be over at the soft serve ice cream for the next two hours. When you have a large family, you just, you got to be all, you got to go someplace where you can get everything for everybody. John 14, 6 is a verse in the Bible that shows us that Jesus has everything. One stop shopping for your soul. Let's read it together up on the screen here. Let me read it to you. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now let's try again to have a pulse. Would you read that out loud with me please today? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I want to get you to that point in John 14, John 13 through John 18, all kinds of red letters, Jesus giving his last discourse, the high priestly prayer. Before he said this, what we get in John 14 is we're kind of getting Jesus mid-discourse, mid-paragraph. He spent an exhausting night in John 13 with the disciples. In chapter 13, he rises up. If you've not read about this before or not noticed, it's what has come to be known as the Last Supper. They're going to celebrate the Passover together. There's no servants, just Jesus and the disciples. He rises mid-dinner. So it's in the middle of dinner. Jesus gets up and he starts to go around the table. And you've heard this story. He gets down and he takes out a cloth and a bowl and he begins to wash the feet of the disciples. Now, being a religious culture, Uh, with lots of habits and traditions, it's quite likely that the disciples had spent that whole dinner wondering why is there not a servant here to wash our feet? 
It was important because of the times, you know, the dirt and the dust and the sandals. It was also important because of the religious requirements of being clean before eating together. And the disciples might have spent the whole meal wondering why there's no servant to wash their feet, or maybe why none of the other lesser disciples had risen from their place of lowliness to do it. Don't you think some of them, like Peter, James, and John, were probably thinking like, this, this feels like a Bartholomew thing right now. This seems like Levi or one of these guys we've never heard of. They should be doing this. I guarantee that since they occasionally spent great portions of the Bible arguing over who was the greatest and who was Jesus' favorite and how James, Peter, John, and Jesus should just get a place together at the Mount of Transfiguration, it was quite likely that they're all sitting around thinking someone else should be doing this right now. I know it's not me. I know it's not Jesus but someone else should be doing this. I'm confident that Peter, James, and John didn't have any idea to think that they should do it. They were the three favorites, if there's such a thing, or the closest companions of Jesus Christ. He really brings them low, Jesus does, when he gets up and washes their feet. They're really freaked out by this. They're really taken aback. They've spent three years kind of trying to understand how do I worship and adore the teacher who's so down to earth and so giving and sacrificial to me, but is just so different and so greater than we are. And then he just throws them just for a loop when he kneels down and washes their feet. You remember the famous scene where Peter says, Lord, you shouldn't do this. And Jesus said, well, if you don't let me do this, you have no part with me. And then, you know, Peter says, well, let's, let's get it on then, keep doing it. They feel shame. It's hard to understand, and pastors like to overstate things. It's one of our job descriptions, but... They're really, this has got to be one of the top, most shocking things that ever happened in the history of the world. We know the story. We know it's good to be sacrificial and to be humble and try to be like Jesus. But you think about everything to that point in Jewish and in human history. All religious systems viewed God as unapproachable. The Jews wouldn't even pronounce his name, though they might be blasphemous by saying it. The Pharisees had built a whole market on being self-important, self-righteous, set above and greater than the masses that were trying to follow their faith and follow their God. Spiritual attainment was largely understood then and now, sadly, as how holy can you be, how pure, how set apart, how superior to others can you be and can you become. And in chapter 13 of John, Jesus really obliterates their pride, and they can't, even, they can't even really compute what's going on. We can. We look back, and we understand. They never got over that night until Jesus brought his Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1. They never fully understood what happened then. Jesus removes all their little fighting and all their preening, and he institutes a new way to greatness. Once again, after they were fighting on the road of who's the greatest, He institutes a new way to greatness, smallness. And then he drops another bomb as if they're not reeling enough trying to figure that out. Then Jesus says, oh, you know this beautiful, tight-knit brotherhood that we have? One of you is going to betray me. And then he gives this real cryptic word. The one who dips his bread in the cup is the one who has betrayed me. And you know they were wondering who it is and all the different accounts. Is it me? Is it them? Who is it, Lord? It's not I, is it? And then Judas slips out. And you would think that because we know the story, you would think, oh, they all knew it was Judas. But Judas was the treasurer. That was where you put the guy who was of importance and trustworthiness. They likely did not even notice what we all notice with hindsight and what the Bible kind of clearly articulates about the timing of it. And then later... Did the disciples think that Peter was the betrayer? Because Jesus actually pulls Peter aside and says, you're going to betray me before the rooster crows three times. It's possible that they actually thought Peter, who ends up being, at that time, was one of the great disciples and ends up being the founder of the church in a lot of ways, is maybe the one they don't know. The words we look at today are now Jesus' encouragement because he also tells them in chapter 13, I'm going to die. I'm going to be delivered up. I'm going to be crucified. You're not going to have me around anymore. So let's read now 14, 1 through 7. Get the context of the way, the truth, and the life. After saying he's going away and you can't go where he's going, Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. They're very troubled. They're very anxious. You don't tell people to calm down or be not troubled unless they are troubled. 
Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. They need peace, and I want to show you in this passage, this is not just a funeral passage. This is not just a, oh, uh, you know, this is how you get to heaven passage. This is meeting a real need in this moment where they have doubts and wonder about their relationship with Jesus Christ anymore. First, what we see is the pathway to peace. Jesus as Lord of your life. When Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled, troubled, believe in God, believe also in me, there's an amazing spiritual truth, a theological grand reality that's being communicated here. He says, believe in God and believe also in me. A lot of people will say Jesus never said he was God. And I, I've told you many times, you know, um, that Jesus' first year was obscurity. No, nobody knew who he was. His second year was popularity. The crowds start coming out. And then his third year, when he starts to really reveal why he's here, is a year of hostility. And so what we're seeing here is as Jesus drops these little truths about what's coming and where he's going, we see hostility coming toward the phase where he makes it more clear that he's God. He says here that he is equal to the Father. Believe in God, believe also in me. It's not explicit, but he says, I am equal to the Father. Believe in God, believe also to me, in me. That he's equal and he's the promised one of Israel. There is ultimately no peace. There is no peace for you. There is no peace without a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Do you have one? Do you have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Or do you have religion? Or do you have your parents' or grandparents' faith? Do you have a good habit of being a good person? Or do you have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ? We learn in the next verses the place and the people of peace. Yes, he's talking about heaven with Jesus Christ, with God the Father one day. But there's something greater going on here. Let's look at verse 2 and 3 now in John 14. To put them at peace, when he says, I am the way and the truth of the life, that's coming. But he says, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Have you ever heard before this passage communicated, uh, it's kind of old timey, but it'll come up in our thinking sometimes that we actually have a mansion waiting for us in heaven. The, the King James would say that there are many mansions. And it's weird how that just kind of culturally became acceptable because for most of the time, people have lived in a little hut with like, you know, 18 people in it, and that's no fun. And so when we heard about the Father having mansions or when we hear about the things, the streets in heaven are paved with gold and all those different imagery that just point to a greater, more beautiful, holy reality than we could even understand, we get this idea that, well, I get a mansion. We all get one. And a lot of popular thought about heaven is that it's tailored to you. Like, well, your mansion's going to have tile floor, you know, and, and your mansion's going to have Diet Mountain Dew on demand. And your mansion is going to be on a hill because you love views. And yours is going to be by water because you love the water. When really, there's a different picture here. The, the picture of heaven is that we are a people. That we are a people. The Christian faith is communal. And the picture here of the afterlife is not mansions and individual wish lists, it's a picture actually of just the typical everyday Hebrew homestead of the time. The father of the family, the patriarch of the family, has provided space for his children and their new families, and they are all one family together. Now before you say no, thank you, please, you gotta understand it's a totally different culture, one built on respect, 
one built on the understanding that I live to honor and respect my father here on earth, and one day I will be in that position with my family. It was all very orderly and very uh, understood that this is how it works, but the father would provide this space, and there were places to pull aside and have privacy and be your own family and have your own alone time as subsets of the family, but the feasts of the faith and the meals and the celebrations and the announcements would all happen. Uh, do we have a picture of this? Would kind of all happen in this, this is just you know somebody's guess looking at ruins and different things. In this kind of common area in the middle, people could come together and be a family of families. And out of respect, it all revolved around the Father's house. This is the picture that Jesus gives. This is the picture of heaven, but it's a picture of now too. What it's gonna be like in the church with the Spirit of God, when the Spirit is put into our lives, when the Holy Spirit has come to be our counselor and our communer. The reality of this community and togetherness in the Christian faith is one more reason I wanna talk about something I've been talking about the last months. And I wanna especially talk to our online audience. It's time to come back to church. It's time to come back to church. If you could be in this room, you could see the safety precautions and the distancing that's happening and families sitting together while the next several feet down is a different family. You could see in the meeting place, there may only be 10 or 20 people over there, just very spread out. But it's time to come back to church. About six months ago, it made a lot of sense to to be good and to do as we were asked and to be a great example. We're still doing what we're asked, by the way. But to separate for a time, and there was maybe even some enjoyment of, oh, this is a new way to do church. This is a more convenient or, or a more personal way for a season. It was good to do those things, and it was right to do those things, but there has crossed a t there's come a time, and I believe we've crossed that Rubicon as a church and as a culture. It's time that some of you need to assess the harm that's been done to your faith by not being around other Christians in a real and wholesome way for now six going on seven months. Any ver version of Christianity that is done out of selfishness or ease to keep away from certain kinds of people or to keep away from certain kinds of relationships is not a Christianity at all. And I'll always caveat this with you gotta do what your doctor has told you to do. You need to make wise decisions for yourself. But I look around a room of many people who would be at-risk people because they've decided at this point it's time to come back together. And I want to challenge you. It's time to come back. Has the harm that's been done to our faith, our hope, and our love greater than the very small risk of assembling together for an hour each Sunday? to worship and honor the Lord Jesus Christ together. This verse that I'm reading in a lot of ways is about heaven and about what's coming next with the Holy Spirit, but it's more about Jesus and us together. We need him, but we need him together. We figure out how to do the pursuit of peace. Because remember, Jesus is one stop shopping for your soul. He's the way, he's the truth, and the life. In verse four and five, we see the pursuit of, pay, of, of peace. Jesus says, you know the way to where I'm going. Imagine hearing that. Jesus says, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna be delivered up, I'm gonna be sacrificed, I'm gonna be crucified, and, they go, and I'm leaving you for a time. And he says, well, where are you going? And he says, you know. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Thomas gets a bum rap as always asking dumb questions. He's the dumb apostle. For centuries, we've called him Doubting Thomas. Like, that's what you want to be. Like, everyone else was just this virtue and paragon of faith, and Thomas is just a mouth-breathing idiot asking dumb questions. Remember when they're in the upper room, and Jesus is resurrected, and they're having this hallelujah party in the upper room? Thomas comes in late because he didn't register ahead of time or something, and he comes in, and he's like, uh, unless I can touch your wounds, I won't know if you're really you know, here or not. And you're like, ooh, Thomas, that's so gross. You're so weird, and you're so doubting. We think that, but he's only dumb in hindsight from an enlightened Christological perspective. 
they are really great and necessary questions. Thank God Thomas is in the Bible because he's more like us. He's the guy asking what everyone else is afraid to ask. He wants clarity. So let's look at Thomas for dummies right now. What is he asking right now? He's not really asking, I don't think, like, are you going to take a left, you know, at Jerusalem? And are you going to circle the bakery? Where, you know, he, where are you going? He's saying, whoa, 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 you just blew this whole thing up, Jesus. You just blew this whole thing up. We have this amazing fellowship. My life is changing. I have love. I have acceptance. I have purpose. I have got a little power in my life now. And you're going to blow this whole thing up. Where are you going? What he wants to know is how can I keep this going? How can I continue to have you in my life and have unity with you and with these guys? This is a question everyone should be asking. And after six months of the shutdown and all the weird psychological things it's done to all of us, it's time for the Christian church to start thinking, where do we go now? I know God wants us to be together. I know God wants me to practice my faith with others. How can I have you, Jesus? How can I have real Christian community? I don't want to lose this. I don't want to do this on my own. Anybody that wants to do it on their own or in their own little holy huddle is denying the truth of Scripture and the call of the gospel. And it's, at its ultimate end, selfish and insecure. I don't want to lose this. Jesus says, I'm the precise person of peace. Where am I going, Thomas? Let me try to explain you. And just a spoiler alert, Thomas isn't going to understand this either. Jesus said to him, I am the way. Where are you going? I am the way. Okay, so follow you. I am the way and the truth. Wait, wait a minute. The truth is like an abstract concept. Where are you going? I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Incredible things happening right now. The way, I want to simplify this. The way, the truth, the life. The way, the truth, the life. I firmly believe there's a few Bible passages that if we just tried to live that one verse, it would keep us going for the next 20 or 30 years. How could I live a faith life that honors that Jesus is the way, Jesus is the truth, and Jesus is the life. Uh, Jesus is the precise person of peace. The way means follow me, follow me. The truth means worship me. When you have the truth about what God is, who he is, it will lead you to worship Jesus Christ. I'm the way, I'm the truth, and then I'm the life. And this is something that Jesus brings that no other religion has, no other dead faith can. Jesus infuses life and resurrection power into you and I through the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage you that the life means life. It means enjoy God. It means resurrection power. The way means follow me. The truth means worship me. The life means enjoy me. Here's some important truths from this scripture. I want to just lay out truths we need to agree on and then some ways to apply these truths. Number one, there's no other way that leads to heaven except Jesus. There's no other way that leads to heaven except Jesus. Church, maybe God's paring us down through these six months. Maybe that's one of the things that's happening. Maybe comfortable, cultural, pseudo-Christianity is gonna go out the window and maybe a new, strong, rising, committed faith is gonna come in its place. But the church has to get on board with there is no other way than Jesus Christ. We gotta stop going, well, that's what I believe on Sunday, but I don't really believe it in my conversations. I'm not gonna share that with anybody because it seems really off-putting and exclusionary. We gotta get on board. There's no other way that leads to heaven except Jesus. We've got to get on board with there is no other truth that saves but the truth of Jesus. If you want to see my eyes roll so roll that they fall out of my head and go across the stage, tell me that something is your truth. When people say, well, this is my truth. And I was making fun of this like three or four years ago when I first heard it. People are still doing it. It's a troubling development. There's no my truth, their truth. There's the truth. 
There's the truth. And we use it to excuse our sins. And I want you to watch out for this. I'm going to tell you the truth. We have all these convictions as Christians about many important things. But what I've seen over 30 years of walking with Jesus is the minute someone in someone's circle believes a different way, somebody that I love or care about, I throw the truth out the window because I don't want to offend this person and their truth. Now, we should be loving. If someone is living, and God knows we're all sinners and we're sinning all the time, so we should not judge other sins worse than our sins. But when someone in our circle is living outside of the love of God and call, or outside of the plan of God and saying they're doing it in Jesus' name and that God's cool with it, we need to love, we need to encourage. They can't think we hate them or we judge them, but we need to be firm with what the truth is. I haven't expressed that quite perfectly, but let me just try to be more succinct. We can't change the truth for someone else's truth. And the church is doing that left, right, forward, backward, up, down, all the time. Let's not be jerks for Jesus, but let's cling to the truth. There's no other truth that saves but the truth of Jesus. There's no other life than Jesus. Colin and I like to point out when we stumble over something that just makes Christianity so unique from the other faiths. The life that Jesus gives through the resurrection that he promises through the Holy Spirit is not promised and is not given in such a total life-changing package in any other religion. Religions don't promise that God lives inside of you. That's something that Jesus has done, that Jesus has promised, and that you can check his promise with. Buddhism offers transcendental peace of mind. Islam offers strict religious piety. Judaism offers the law and a way through suffering. The Hindu has a god or a demigod for every occasion. Humanism, or what we would just call being an American these days, offers self and herd mentality righteousness. The Mormon faith advertises moral excellence. The Unitarian faith, no one's really sure what they do. But Jesus offers himself. Jesus offers himself. In Jesus alone is life everlasting, truth that stands the test of time. And in Jesus, there's no more guessing about what's right and wrong or what you should do. This is the way. There's no more working the angles of tithing and giving and longevity in the multi-level pyramid scheme of religious marketing. Jesus says, it's me, it's me, it's me. What you're looking for is me, what you need is me, the way is me, the truth is me, and the life that you seek is me. And here's another little amazing thing that happens in our Christian faith. When Jesus is baptized and set forth into his three years of earthly ministry, the Father and the Spirit confirm his ministry. You may or may not buy that there is a Father and there is a Spirit and there is a Son of God, but every, everybody likes to say there's one God, and we're all just trying to figure it out. We're all just trying to get there. It's all the same, and if you went over there, they're just like us, but their God's called this, and if you go to this part of the world, their God's called this. But aren't we all just the same? Aren't we all just trying to be good? Aren't we all just trying to get along and do some good stuff in the world and have our good outweigh our bad? No, that's actually not what we're all doing, and no one else has recorded in their holy books that when their guy came on the scene, the Father and the Spirit said, that's the guy. That's the one. And everyone else is just grabbing at straws and trying to make sense of life. And you hold in your hands the truth of the universe, the way, the truth, and the life. Let's apply this. But remember, Jesus is one-stop shopping for you. He's what you need. A lot of this application starts in the brain, and it's going to come out. I'm not going to send you off on bicycles to do anything today. But number one, you've got to strip away needless religion and dig into Jesus. You might think it's corny, but we have the name of Jesus on our building and in in lots of places around our building on our Jesus cards because it's really just about Jesus. And we mess things up daily as a church and you mess things up daily as a Christian, but who doesn't? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Make it about Jesus. Make it about Jesus. Second, church, we gotta embrace the uniqueness and the exclusivity of Jesus as Savior. 
you may not all be bold proclaimers of the faith. I think you can be. I think you want to be. But we've got to get on board with Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the one. Ask questions. Ask Jesus questions. He can handle it. Isn't it great that Thomas asked what kind of seems like a dumb question and it gave one of the best Bible verses you could ever see in your life? Ask Jesus questions. If you're concerned about this, if you're confused about this, don't harden your heart. Don't blame it on the church or some pastor who offended you once. Take it to Jesus and say, Jesus, explain this to me. Jesus, help me see this. When in doubt, follow the way of Jesus. It's amazing. People have tried. I know this is still a thing, but you remember the WWJD bracelets? What would Jesus do? And you either loved it or mocked it. it came out. But when we're sitting here, we're like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. What would Jesus do? And I'm just going to do that. But we don't like that because it's usually the opposite of what we want to do. What would Jesus do? Well, he would forgive. Well, I would rather hold a grudge. What would Jesus do? He would give more. I would not like to do that. What would Jesus do? Jesus would probably care more about whether his friends were going to hell than whether he fit in by drinking with them or doing whatever. What would Jesus do? But instead, our bracelet would be like, you know, what would I like to do and how can I put a little splash of Jesus on it at the end just enough to get into heaven? And that's a lot of initials. That's a lot of abbreviating. Who has time for it? When in doubt, follow the way of Jesus. Forgive when you're wrong. Give more than you take. Uh, fourth, I think, when in, uh, fifth, build your life, your family, your schedule around this simple ideology. You know, I get a little worked up sometimes because everybody wants something to be like super deep or super like earth shattering when they are in a Bible study in their small group or in church. And we love to sip the lattes and, you know, talk about the mysteries of life. But would you guys just start living Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We're stuck on the malto meal tasty foods. We need the basic stuff. We need to give it all to Jesus Christ, and then we might be ready for something deeper, something more. If I'm pursuing deeper and more, may it be so that I can love God deeper and more, worship God deeper and more. Imagine if you built your life, your family, and your schedule around this sentence. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We try to make the gospel so complicated. It's so simple. It's not easy, amen? But it is simple. Jesus wants all of you. He wants everything about you. He loves you so ridiculously deeply that you can trust him with all of you and with everything you are and have but it's quite simple Jesus is the way will you follow him Jesus is the truth will you accept it Jesus is the light do you want it and then I do want to challenge you to just share this simple message with people in a way that is you and in a way that is real carry and pass on the message that Jesus is the way the truth and the life. Let this one sentence rattle your cage a little bit this week and change your life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And see if you don't agree with me that Jesus is one-stop shopping for your soul. He has everything you need, all the peace you need as a sinner, all the purpose you need as a saint. He has everything you need. Would you pray with me? I just want to invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads for a moment.
just take a moment before we respond to God in worship. Are you on the way with Jesus right now? Are you following him? If not, just confess. God, I've not been following you. God, I've lost your way. Come back to him today. Do you accept the truth of Jesus? It's not popular in our culture. Heck, it's not even popular in our churches anymore. That's pretty messed up. But you know what the truth is. You know what the truth is about Jesus Christ and what he wants for your life because if he's in you, you can feel it in your very soul. You know if you're dabbling and doing things that don't honor and glorify God. You know because you're miserable. You know if you're trying to get away with sins that you're not getting away with it in God's eyes, that it'll all come out, and so you're full of shame and you're full of anger. But it's not God's problem. It's not your parents' problem. It's not your spouse's problem. It's the problem of being a sinner. And so confess that sin. Accept the truth of God through Jesus Christ. Be different than this world which is so lost and fall headlong in worship and adoration of God because of Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you need his life, just call out to him in prayer right now. God, I need your resurrection life. I need your power. I need that joy that comes with drinking from your wells and eating at your table, of filling up with your word as with the finest of foods. I need the way, I need the truth, but I need your life, God. Father, I pray that as we worship you, we would be real with you, we would be open with you, we would be kind and compassionate to all. But in this moment, that we would worship you, we would adore you, we would draw close to you. Turn us from singers, or from mumblers or listeners into worshipers and lovers of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
caught today in what Dave said because it was all over the scriptures we looked at. It was all over the talk. Jesus is the only way. He's the only way to have peace in your life in a time when so many of us need peace in our lives. We get so obsessed with what's going on out there and how do we fix this and how do we fix that. We don't pay attention to the fact that Jesus is all you need. He's all you need to find that peace in the midst of the storm inside of yourself. He is the answer. And more than that, he's the answer. He's the way to heaven. He's the way to have a relationship with God, to know God as your father. And so if you want to make that decision, if you want to follow Jesus, or if you want to come back to him, if you've been away, I want to invite you. um, Would you pray with me right now? We're going to pray a very simple prayer. Go ahead and close your eyes, bow your heads. I'm going to pray a very simple prayer and invite Jesus into your life. And um, this is a prayer that I want to ask you, just repeat the words after me. It's not anything special about the words, but this is an opportunity right here and now to talk to God, to tell him, I want something different. I want that peace of Jesus Christ. I want to know you as my father. I want to spend eternity with you in the place that you've prepared for me. Pray this prayer with me if you want to know God. Father God, I believe that I was created to know you and live for you. I believe that Jesus paid the penalty for my sins and that through his death on the cross, he brought me back to you. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. I give my life to you. Followers of Jesus in the room, those who have just prayed that prayer right now, those who have been walking with Jesus for a long time, maybe some of you who have felt a need to come back to him in this time, I want to encourage you that God loves you so much, that Jesus is never away from you, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is always available, and his peace is the peace that passes all understanding, all earthly understanding. No one can explain it, but those who know it in Jesus Christ know it comes only through him. God, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Hey, uh, go ahead and have a seat.
you did pray that prayer with me today for the first time, or if you have more uh, questions and you want to know about following Jesus, I want to encourage you to pick up a Jesus card. You can come get one physically from me, or you can also find this on our website, on the homepage, on the right-hand side. There's a button that says Jesus, and you can click on that, find the information there. And then also on our website, a great way to get in touch with us um, if you have questions about following Jesus or any prayer requests or anything like that is our Contact Us form also on the homepage of the website. We also want to remind you to be keeping up with your um, giving. We're not going to be, during this time, passing the hat like we normally would to do our offering, but still very important and a very great way to um, worship God and participate in uh, His uh, the way that uh, we get to worship Him together through song and through hearing His word, also through giving as a way to worship God. And so we want to encourage you to do that. You can drop it in the drop boxes on the side of the room. You can take it out in the lobby. Lots of different ways on the screen behind me, online and in person to do that. But would you join me in praying to God for our offering, just that God would continue to bless and provide for our church. Father God, we just um, we just want to confess that, God, we are probably never as grateful or as thankful for the provision that you've given us. Um, God, we just want to be people in this world where we're so concerned about money and not having enough of it or how we can get more of it. God, we just want to be a people who are so at peace with all of that because we know we have a God who provides everything we need for us. God, help us to see more and more that everything we have comes from you and teach us to be thankful. God, as we give, grow our joy in the gospel and grow our connection to you. In Jesus' name. Hey, a couple more things before we let you go. If you dropped your kids off at the beginning of service or if you sent them out uh, when we dismissed them earlier, you're going to want to go down the hall to pick them up. And here's the thing. If you go down the hall to pick them up, make sure you're ready to go because we're going to ask you to exit through the doors down there. If you got to come back in the building, it's not like we're not going to let you back in. You can circle back around. But just know that once you head down that hallway, you're going to exit through the gift shop. So uh, keep that in mind. Hey, thank you so much for being here to worship with us. Thank you for joining us to lift up God's name and to be a church together. Also, to those of you next door in the meeting place, thank you so much. And those of you who joined us online, thank you, thank you as well. Um, it's great to worship together as a church, and we are so blessed that we're able to do that. Amen? All right. Hey, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Love you guys.